Well, good afternoon. <clears throat> Thank you all for coming. Um, my name's Rod Richardson. I'm with the Grace Richardson Fund, and it's a pleasure to be here. Um, uh, you know, I, I'm particularly thrilled to be addressing millennial leadership here because uh, a lot of uh, folks in that group have played a big role in the development of this concept of clean tax cuts, and I'll tell you a little bit more about that uh, as we go on. I'm, I'm also very excited because um, the Richardson Family Foundations have been involved with the Atlanta Council for a long, long time. Uh, you know, the Smith Richardson Foundation and the Atlantic uh, Foundation, Atlantic Council were, uh, you know, both uh, came out of the Cold War era uh, and worked together for many, many decades on uh, both foreign policy and uh, international market solutions. Uh, so this reflects a, a long history. But um, I want to talk to you today a little bit about a new idea uh, that is uh, gaining some traction uh, that we are uh, developing at Grace Richardson, uh, the, uh, the idea of clean tax cuts. Um, <clears throat> if I could, you know, basically to give you a, a overview of the concept, um, you know, for S Smith Richardson Foundation, where I worked for uh, a while on the, grant, on the uh, grants board in the 1980s, uh, developed many of the ideas behind the Reagan revolution. We came out of a very much out of the conservative side uh, and made a lot of new ideas tip. Um, one of those ideas was supply side economics. And it always, uh, you know, I, I always wondered why uh, when people were talking about problems of climate and pollution and things like that, they didn't think that perhaps supply side economics could apply to these problems because after all, these are uh, problems of supply. Supply of uh, pollutants and greenhouse gases versus supply of clean solutions. So a, a supply side economist would tell you that you can have a powerful effect uh, if you want more of something, tax it less, uh, and especially if you uh, apply that to the capital taxes that investors pay on debt and equity. So that is exactly what the clean tax cuts concept is. Um, it rewards positive practices rather than punishing negative ones. As one of the participants here said, you know, carrots uh, are more attractive than sticks, uh, you know, and especially if you're a conservative, uh, you know, if you're trying to reach out to conservatives and tell them to care about climate change, and then they do start to care, and then they ask you, what are we going to do? And you tell them, well, you know, well, we're going to do carbon taxes and then subsidies and regulation. That sounds to them a lot like taxes spending in big government. So you need you need a solution that can make allow conservatives to. Uh, uh, walk through the door. So essentially this is, you know, the, the idea is, is basically simple investment tax rate cuts to all income, interest, and other capital taxes that investors pay. You know, we, it, we try to keep it very simple, uh, you know, picking metrics, not winners or losers, and have it be based on verifiable metrics for clean practices. Um, this is economy-wide. It can, it can target uh, really any negative externality. It doesn't necessarily have to be just climate. For instance, uh, we've been asked to conduct a charrette on how to use clean tax cuts to reduce waste plastic. Uh, there are other issues that could are, have been addressed uh, in the agricultural sector by the Nature Conservancy looking at this. Uh, for instance, uh, water issues and water pollution. Um, <clears throat> so. But most importantly, one of the, the, the things to emphasize is that this really is different from other kinds of, of pollution and environmental policy that you will have heard about. We don't impose taxes, fees, regulations. This is not carbon offsets, offsets tax credit price support subsidies, artificial markets of any kind, barriers to capital of any kind. This is a very simple solution that involves just simply lowering the cost of capital, uh, lowering barriers to capital. And there's a reason why it's coming forward now. And it didn't come forward three or four or five years ago. In fact, the first public presentation of this was only a year ago. Uh, in fact, a year ago Tuesday was the first public presentation of this. So this is exactly, one, this concept is exactly one year old. And I'm going to tell you a little bit about where we've come in the last year and why. But to in order for you to understand why 
it came, we came forward with it last year. This conference is called Tipping Points. And I want to share with you what I think is perhaps one of the most significant tipping points. No doubt you will have heard about a little bit about this previously in the conference, but I think some of the implications of it have been missed. This is the Lazard Levelized Cost of Energy Analysis 9.0. This is the, the analysis that came out in November of 2015. To me, this is a very significant benchmark because for the first time, it showed both wind and uh, uh, utility scale solar at a lower LCOE than any fossil fuel or any other energy source except energy efficiency, which had already been cheaper for a long, long time. That was a really significant tipping point uh, because, it, 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 I mean, we are in the middle of a long tipping point that's going to take several years. But those technologies are now uh, at the best cited locations cheaper than fossil fuels. And that is why you're seeing the incredible market growth in these things where they're achieving grid parity and there's more new installations in, in the energy in wind and solar and renewables than there are in traditional fossil fuels. Uh, going on because of this profitability. Now, <clears throat> many uh, people have noted this, but few have noted perhaps one of the implications of this. And the implications of this are that all existing climate policy, which was created in an era prior to this, is now subtly out of date and becoming increasingly irrelevant. Because all of it is based on the assumption that clean solutions could not be profitable. Because 10, 20, 30 years ago, that seemed to be the case. It seemed to be that most clean solutions would not be profitable. And you needed to have a price adjustment mechanism in order to make it work. And if you didn't have a price adjustment mechanism, you needed a control mechanism. So you needed price support subsidies, carbon pricing, or regulation, or it simply wouldn't work. Well, <clears throat> now that you have profitability, there's a new option, which is capital acceleration. Right? You, that's what you need. When you have profits, you need a way of accelerating more capital to those investments. And you can do that very directly. You don't have to go around the barn. When you don't, when you don't have profits, you need to construct all kinds of elaborate mechanisms to make something work. You know, you need to go back and do these things. You know, you need to have regulations, offsets, carbon markets, all that kind of stuff, because you don't have profits. So you need to create all these kinds of very complicated, almost Rube Goldberg-esque devices in order to make these things work. But <clears throat> not so when you uh, when you have uh, profits. So that's the implication. We are right now in the middle of what I think will at one point be regarded as the clean capitalist revolution. Uh, and I don't think it's quite been labeled that yet, but I think it will be, much the way the Industrial Revolution wasn't called the Industrial Revolution at the time, but we now know that's really what it was. But the clean capitalist revolution all started back in the 1970s. And one of the leading thinkers behind it was this man, Avery Lovins, who, as a young man there, uh, was persuading Jimmy Carter to put solar panels on the White House. Uh, you know, it, it was Avery Lovins' vision of the soft path and, uh, you know, his, his argument that private markets could drive this, that companies could pursue profitable uh, strategies uh, to, de to decarbonize and to uh, pursue energy efficiency that has led to the successful uh, cl clean uh, capitalist revolution that we have now. Um, this is a year ago uh, yesterday. It, and, uh, you know, I was very fortunate that the, in the audience when I announced this policy, Amory Levins was there because he, he he took me aside afterwards and uh, talked to me for three hours. And he showed me his bananas that he was growing indoors in his house at 6,000 feet with no internal heating. And I said, my god, this guy's a genius. <laughs> and uh, you know, he said to me, Rob, this is a very intriguing idea. We need to do a charrette. And I said to him, Amory, 
what's a charrette? <laughs> That's great, I'll, I'll do it, but what's a charrette? So he explained to me that a charrette is something that they do in uh, architecture. They're, I don't know, has anyone been involved in a charrette here? Who knows what they are? Yes, yeah, some, some folks have. They're, they are um, these design meetings from architecture. It uh, comes from the Middle Ages at the Sorbonne. Uh, you know, the architecture students uh, would be finishing their scale models of the cathedrals and putting them on a cart uh, to take to the professor. They'd get in the cart and put on the finishing piece, and they were said to be en charrette in the cart. So it became a term of architecture for these meetings where experts get together to design something. Uh, and they have a design focus. You don't get out of the meeting until you finish the design. And um, he suggested these uh, uh, charrettes uh, to develop this project. Uh, Rocky Mountain Institute was using uh, charrette process to figure out energy efficiency projects. And they'd been doing that for years. Uh, and I think Amory was itching to apply this to public policy. So I seem like a likely guinea pig, you know, a guy with an interesting idea, and this could be done from the beginning. So I said yes, because it seemed like a good idea. By the way, the Atlantic Council was subtly involved from the beginning, because that's Bill Stetson, who's a senior fellow here at the Atlantic Council. Uh, he's my cousin introducing me to, uh, to Amory, his longtime friend. But um, so we held our first charrette at, at uh, Columbia University in September. Uh, and, uh, you know, there were a lot of smart people in the room who ripped, uh, you know, the idea apart and put it back together. But some of the best input actually came from, uh, you know, some of the younger members of the team. Uh, I'd point out David Parham, who is an analyst from uh, SASB, uh, you know, he uh, really uh, determined the course of, of clean tax cut development. Uh, you know, he pointed out to us that every sector has unique challenges and unique metrics. So if you're going to design this properly, you need to do it sector by sector. You need to break it up into two sectors to proceed properly. And indeed, because of that uh, analysis, we did break it up into sectors. And since then, have done uh, seven different uh, uh, charrettes on seven different sectors uh, based on his recommendations. Um, Scott Nystrom from FTIT, uh, FTI Consulting, uh, you know, was able to do on-the-spot impact modeling, uh, you know, and, and, and do some back-of-the-envelope calculations that showed that if you replaced uh, renewable energy, clean energy subsidies uh, with uh, clean tax cuts, uh, on a static basis, you'd have a $20 a ton carbon tax equivalent impact on the economy. If you used a dynamic scoring basis, you could have up to a $40 a ton impact uh, using these. Um, <clears throat> we, and, uh, but in any event, we, uh, after the uh, uh, charrette, uh, you know, various people there and then, uh, you know, some of them stuck, stuck up their hands and said, we want to take this sector, and then several weeks later said, we want to take that sector. Um, the uh, uh, R Street Institute, Katri Katrina was at the first threat, uh, and uh, so was Eli Lehrer from R Street Institute. They took the uh, transportation sector uh, because uh, David Parham had identified it as being perhaps one of the easiest areas to uh, apply clean tax cuts. You have very, very clear metrics uh, in that uh, sector, uh, CAFE reporting standards, right? So we know the average vehicle fleet efficiency for every manufacturer. You can take that number and basically turn it into a tax rate. The higher the fleet efficiency, the lower the tax rate. Uh, so you have a very clear mechanism uh, to, to uh, change behavior in the automobile industry. So R Street did a study on, on that. But Columbia University grabbed green bonds and let me just go through a couple of these uh, charrettes that were held and give you some of the results uh, that came out of them. And the, uh, the green bond charrette had a number of different proposals. Probably the strongest of the proposals uh, was the tax-exempt clean asset bond uh, idea, which uh, is, uh, and, and another one as well. But the tax-exempt clean asset bonds would finance all assets pre-qualified as delivering a high impact, say, zero emission power sources, electric vehicle factories, uh, you know, maybe equipment in the oil and gas industry that uh, brings down emissions at the wellhead, that kind of thing. Uh, 
what, you know, if you think about what these kinds of bonds do, you know, we already know, you know, they, they're, they're, they're feasible to, I mean, you can see how they'd be easy to consider because we already have municipal bonds. So we already have a, a, a pre-existing example of tax exemption in bonds. Uh, that's not new. But what is new, they create a new kind of security, which is a corporate or private tax exempt bond. So what would these be like? Well, they, they would give issuers a lower cost of capital than anything else they can do. And this, this is absolutely key. One of the uh, uh, observations that came out of the uh, first charrette that was done by Professor Travis Bradford at Columbia is that one of the effects of this clean tax cut concept is that by applying uh, these taxes to the taxes on debt, uh, you can really bring down the cost of capital. Uh, you know, if you can take two or three percentage points off of cost of capital, you can take 20 to 30 percent off the cost of outputs. That means much cheaper clean electricity, much cheaper clean cars. So this is a, a potential tool, not just for driving a shift to cleaner energy that costs a lot more, but driving a shift to cleaner energy that costs a lot less. Right, so it's, it's a very powerful tool, but the attractiveness for the issuer is that they could finance these projects with a lower cost of capital than anything else they can get. For the issuer, for the, for the investor on, the, uh, you know, on their side, they're looking at a higher tax-free return than anything else that they can get. Because the muni bonds have a uh, lower interest rate because they're very risk, you know, they don't have as much risk because they're backed by the taxpayers. On the other hand, the, the Corporate bonds have a much uh, higher interest rate uh, because they're private. So you've arguably just created a, a security that's more attractive than either anything in the $3.7 trillion muni bond market or the $35 trillion US bond market. So the potential to leverage trillions of dollars of capital is there because of the fundamental attractiveness of the security. Um, <clears throat> These should score very well, too, in terms of dynamic scoring, because even though you're giving full tax exemption, the very nature of, of uh, debt is that it is used by corporations as leverage. In other words, it's used to drive profits to the equity side. You finance a project, you give the bondholders a fixed interest rate, which is, and you're expecting much higher profits than that. So they get three, four, five, six percent interest or whatever it is, nine percent. Uh, and hopefully the equity side is getting much more profits. Uh, so you can still tax those profits on the equity side. Uh, you don't necessarily need to give away the farm on the equity side in order to have an effect. Um, <clears throat> You know, one question that has been, since we came out with the charrette, there are a lot of be people been asking, could this be the basis for a UN global agreement on tax exemption uh, for green bonds globally? Uh, and that would be a really interesting possibility if you think about any corporation anywhere in the world being able to finance bonds in any market they want to and any investor would be exempt from taxes. You could see how Possibly we could make globalization work for us to drive down the cost of capital of clean solutions anywhere in the world. Um, <clears throat> so one key caveat, though, and a warning that has come up from comments from several people is, you know, debt is different from equity. And we need to be very careful that we don't kill the goose that laid the golden egg by doing this the wrong way. You know, we have to be, understand that the green bond market is phenomenally successful. I mean, you know, the 3,500% growth rate in four years has gone from $2.6 billion in 2012 to $93.4 billion in 2016. So that's a huge growth rate. And the reason it's so successful is that it is entirely defined by the market, the, the participants themselves. There's no government agency saying what's a green bond. Uh, you know, there's no... Uh, you know, and, and it's this, this fact that it is really a pure capitalist free market uh, that drives that success. You do not want to introduce heavy-handed government regulation. Uh, and another thing you don't want to do is 
do things that are contrary to the practices of the market, right? So for instance, in the, the, the bond market is driven by low costs, right? By uh, the ease of issuance, and the investors expect a predictability of returns, right? So in this sector, you really could not do uh, a scheme that's based on prospective impact verification down the road, where you risk losing the tax exemption uh, by some you know, future impact verification. You would have to base this on uh, pre-qualified uh, assets. That's why this proposal uh, has come forward as probably the best of the proposals, because it's based on pre-qualified assets that are known to have a high impact so that you can give somebody the tax exemption because of the nature of the project that they're doing. It's based on metrics, they've been studied beforehand, but you're not necessarily having to you know, yank away the tax exemption later, which would chill the market. Um, the, the, uh, in the transportation, or the R Street Institute, thank you Katrina, uh, did a, Ian Adams there did a wonderful study um, they focused on this part. Uh, this was just a no notation that the uh, tax exempt clean asset bonds could be used on the debt side to finance things like uh, electric vehicle factories, battery factories, charging stations, and, and uh, things like that to bring down the cost of debt for all of that stuff. But on the, on the um, equity side, uh, you could do much less of a tax rate cut, 25 to 50 percent off, some, somewhere in that. And you could do it based on, um, as, I, as I mentioned, the idea of, of matching it up to the vehicle fleet efficiency on a sliding scale depending on performance. So you have a, a way of not only incentivizing the automakers, but giving a competitive advantage to the cleanest firms. So this is a really different approach from the regulatory approach, which you know, puts burdens on people trying to do the right thing. Instead, you give advantages to people doing the right thing. It's a positive feedback loop, which allows them to accelerate capital to the clean solution. So you really accelerate the markets. Um, so it, I also want you to note that this mechanism really isn't possible in every single sector because not every single sector has the good metrics that the, the automobile sector has. However, we did come up with other, other uh, uh, ways uh, to work with different sectors uh, and we'll, we'll go through it and show you. Every sector has its unique uh, uh, kind of issues, but we did find that generally the structure of the tax exempt clean asset bonds works in almost every sector. Uh, and the reduced uh, clean tax rate uh, also works, but you just have to what you're going to be, uh, you know, what you're going to be incentivizing might change a little bit, or how you do it in each sector changes depending on these things. So in the power sector, you would do the tax exempt bonds for the zero emission power storage, storage, transmission, smart grids, and that kind of stuff to bring down the cost of capital for that. The reduced uh, clean tax rate, <clears throat> oh, you know, one of the proposals coming out of the, uh, another organization called Conserve America uh, developed a policy which is uh, essentially um, zero emission energy sources. Uh, the, the revenue from that sold by a utility would be um, zero tax rate. Um, and, you know, the, the interesting thing is if you, I, we don't think that you necessarily need to go to a 0% tax rate, and we think it'll score dynamically much better if you don't. You know, if you only do 25% off of the taxes, that's perfectly, I think, fine. Uh, so we, but the, the important thing is that if you apply that not just to the corporate income tax, but to the taxes that investors pay, right, on uh, dividends, on uh, capital gains, well, think about it. Every single board member has a stock package. Every single uh, member of management and every single employee uh, has those kinds of packages. So you personally incentivize every single member of that corporation to shift over, right? It's a way to change corporate culture. Uh, you know, it's, it's, it's a very much more pervasive incentive than, say, a carbon tax. It really affects them very personally. Um, so, uh, in any event, uh, I, 
you know, we'll say that I'm not going to go through all of these, uh, though you can see the deck later. You could look at, at cleantaxcuts.org uh, for uh, some of these other solutions. But we did have interesting, uh, um, uh, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll address these uh, individually later if in Q&A. But I did want to leave some time for Q&A about this concept and also just briefly tell you a little bit about where we're going with this. Um, the whole idea of, of these charrettes was to get concrete, uh, realistic, practical proposals uh, together in a very short t time frame so that we could uh, put these in front of legislators and decision makers as a policy option to consider as they were considering tax reform. That effort is going ahead, spearheaded by uh, Steve Nadell at the uh, 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 the, the uh, American Council for an Energy Efficient Economy, who is right now working on pulling together all of these different proposals. Um, we also are pulling in new groups that are, want to do more charrettes in, in different areas, such as waste plastic, uh, the rainforest issues. Uh, and in addition to that, um, uh, there is some interest in doing a charrette on uh, clean tax cuts and the role of millennial leadership, uh, which has been fantastic in all of these things. Uh, the Nexus Climate Change Working Group wants to co-host, and maybe even the MLP will, uh, will be uh, co-hosting as well. So if you're interested, that would be great. Another possible charrette is that idea of taking clean tax cuts and turning it into the basis of a global agreement. And we've had some very, very strong uh, uh, interest in that from our hosts uh, today and from uh, other groups like the Wilson Center and others. So all those things are in the works and coming together. And um, we're also starting something called the uh, Clean Capitalist Leadership Council. Um, uh, Trammell Crow, the founder of Earth Day Texas, and Andy Sabin, a Republican uh, uh, donor and conservationist, uh, and myself and uh, a group of other clean capitalists. Uh, are, uh, you know, have started this group, uh, similar to the Citizens Climate Lobby, but is focused on these new kind of capital acceleration tools. Uh, there's a next, going to be a next generation component to that council, uh, because this is next generation policy, uh, we think, and it's only fitting that there should be next generation leadership involved. Uh, so without further ado, let me open the floor to questions. Oh, and there's another millennial who's been involved with us, Sarah Hunt. I'm actually a tail end Gen Xer. <laughs> I think everyone's tired of hearing me talk about cultural sensitivity today, but I want to bring this up. I'm Sarah Hunt. I work at ALEC. Uh, I actually took a group of 10 of our legislators to Earth Day, Texas to participate in the Grace Richardson Fund Clean Tax Cuts Forum there. They universally had a great time. And one of the things when we're talking about finding consensus and finding ways that we can work together and being culturally sensitive. And Rod says this in other places. Um, conservatives and people who are market oriented, you know, their first answer to a problem is not going to be raise taxes or increase regulations or expand the size of government. And the nice thing about the clean tax cuts idea that Rod is pioneering that I think the legislative members at my organization appreciated when they experienced the forum was it's a way to address environmental quality issues that they care about in a way that goes along with values that they already hold, like get the government out of the way, let the market work, and cut taxes for businesses and for small businesses and, and families. So I really appreciate the work, and thank you very much. And I hope everyone will consider this very carefully because it's a policy idea that everyone can find something beneficial in. Mm. Uh, sir, in the back. Uh, hi, Dan Delury. This all sounds great. Um, I've had some experience, uh, uh, including with Steve Nadell from AC, ACEEE, on um, energy efficiency green financing and trying to design programs that uh, incentivize that or, or lower the cost of capital or whatever. You talked about, and maybe you haven't gotten this far yet, but you talked about um, qualified assets so that there wouldn't be any, you know, any uh, mm -hmm. measurement down the road. And mm -hmm. that has sometimes been a problem in the past because 
not everything performs the same later <laughs> on, even though they're all treated equally up front. Yeah. And so just any comment you could offer on that. Well, you know, as I said, you know, uh, debt is different from equity. The kinds of things you can do on the equity side are different from what you can do on the, on the debt side. On the debt side, you really do need to have pre-qualified assets. And then the, the impact verification, I think, should be properly a private market function where you have, you know, uh, sort of a consumer reports on these things and the market is informing themselves about what's really seriously green and what's not. Uh, and then you have reputational effects. Somebody who doesn't perform isn't going to be able to issue as well next time. Uh, you know, you, you have to let it leave room for, uh, you know, the, the market uh, participants to police themselves. On the equity side, uh, you know, people are used to returns based on performance. So, you know, you, you know, you, and that is, is based, you know, so you can do performance based things on the equity side, such as you saw with the R Street proposal on, on uh, transportation. Uh, so, you know, the, the, you have different capabilities on both sides. So I would say that the, the model that we're, we are looking at is you're using the debt side to drive down the cost of capital on these projects as much as possible. You're using the, the equity side more to steer, you know, more to personally incentivize the management and the, uh, the investors. So you, 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 there, t there are two different modalities that work well together. Any other questions? Yes, young lady up, up here. Hi, Nisha Desai. I'm a 2017 uh, Millennium Fellow and just started learning all about energy on Sunday. So uh, <laughs> this is all very fascinating. Uh, my question is, who do you think are the going to be the uh, earliest adopters and issuers of this tax-exempt tax clean bonds? Is it going to be um, U.S. munis? Is it going to be sovereigns? And if the returns are so good on the equity side, who do you think uh, is going to be the initial group um, you know, driving the strategy on the equity side? Well, I, well, munis don't need the tax exemption because they're already tax exempt. Um, I'm not uh, too familiar with the situation with sovereigns, whether, to what degree they're tax exempt or not. Um, but I think that, um, that we have had several <sighs> clean capitalists involved in you know, our work who, who are you know, businessmen who, and investors who have looked at this who are extremely enthusiastic about it, uh, the, especially the green bond uh, concept uh, and believe that it would really help them clean up their industries and would be very attractive to uh, everyone. So uh, it's, it's going to be corporations and investors that, that drive this. Yes. Uh, Max Grunick, Ecologic Institute. One question for the tax, uh, clean tax rate. For these aspects, do you design them as being tradable? Is that part of the design implementation or is that still open? <clears throat> well, uh, y let me just say, let's go to clean And, and if they're tradable, then the follow-up question. In uh, some how, cases, how, in how, some cases, okay. there were some tradable ideas. But basically, look, these are tax rate cuts. This is laissez-faire capitalism. This is a laissez-faire policy. You know, because, so it means it's very simple. It's what the market does ordinarily you know, by itself. We're not trying to distort the market in any way. We're trying to be as natural as possible. Laissez-faire capitalism has three basic policy pillars, right? And that is supporting individual and private uh, property rights. Right, is number one. Number two is reducing barriers to trade and barriers to capital. Number three is getting rid of inefficient laws that no longer make any sense. Clean tax cuts does all three. It's, it's basically all about reducing barriers to capital. This is laissez-faire capitalism because people in the clean solution, uh, clean uh, capitalist sector are doing it already. We just need to let them do it more, laissez-faire more for clean capitalism. Just a thank you. Yes. Just a follow-up question. I've been, I'm being told to stop. To so stop. Maybe you should, okay. Just <laughs> maybe, maybe you should. Anybody who wants okay. to talk to me afterwards, okay. you know, and, and all, also let me say that this is being developed by Charette Process, which means that we really 
bring in a lot of people who want to work with us. So if you're interested in this, please talk to me and you know, we'll tr be sure to, you know, we have lots of shreds coming up and there's lots of opportunities to work on this going forward. Thank you. Thank you, Katrina. Thanks. Uh, so we've talked sticks, we've talked carrots. We're going to take a five minute break so everybody can caffeinate. And we'll come back and talk about innovation and breakthroughs and what it means to actually.